Hi, AP Bio students. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the bacterial transformation lab in detail. And we're going to do it kind of as a dry lab and thought lab, which is really sad because it's probably one of the coolest hands-on labs we have, but we're unable to meet this year. But for now, let's get ready for the AP exam and think about what they're going to be looking at in terms of what you've learned and what the thought process is. Most students have actually done this lab. They did it in the middle of winter when we were covering energetics. So it's just that I run a slightly different curriculum program. And uh, this year it came to bite me because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, as far as the bacterial transformation lab goes, one thing they're gonna be thinking about is can you do good science method? Do you have a control? Do you have a test? Can you analyze your results? The second is the application of DNA technology. By now, hopefully you've learned about restriction enzymes and we're gonna be applying that knowledge. DNA transcription and translation, protein synthesis. Hopefully you've learned about that. That's the central dogma of biology. And also then the idea of applied science using biotechnology. So the lab is a lab wherein we take a harmless E. coli bacteria and we give it a gene. And it uptakes that gene and then begins using that gene the way any cell would use a gene to synthesize proteins. So let's say we wanted to make a, a bacteria that, colony that's going to produce human insulin. We would isolate the human insulin gene from the human genome. We would give it to bacteria, and those bacteria would become an insulin factory. We could uh, then refine and purify the insulin and deliver it as a pharmaceutical. Moving back to transcription and translation. If you understand that DNA code has a start codon, and then a long string of A's, G's, C's, and T's that is encoding for the assembly of amino acids into a protein, and then a stop codon where there isn't a corresponding amino acid, then understanding uh, DNA scissors, the restriction enzymes, if you can actually snip a fragment of DNA and that gene exists within that fragment, you have your start codon, you have your entire list of, of uh, A's, G's, C's, and T's that's going to give you your amino acid sequence, and you have your stop codon, you have the gene. If you can give that snippet to a bacteria, then that bacteria can start to use the gene to make the protein. Scientists have realized that uh, prokaryotes have uh, loop DNA, uh, DNA plasmid, and it's pretty easy to snip that using an endonuclease and insert a gene. And so scientists will often employ two genes at the same time. One gene is the actual target gene and another is a marker gene. It's probably a good bet that if you put a kind of a quiet, hidden protein making gene in a genome, you're really not gonna know if you're making it or not. So you need another gene to shout, I'm here, I'm here. And so you're gonna use kind of a marker gene. One of our favorites is a glowing gene that comes from marine organisms like glowing squid and glowing jellyfish and all those other cool um, bioluminescent uh, bacteria and bioluminescent algae and bioluminescent symbiotic relationships that occur in the ocean where stuff glows. So we're gonna take a target gene and a marker gene. Our target gene is actually kind of a controversial one. It's ampicillin resistance. We're going to make a harmless species of E. coli resistant to antibiotics. So it should be able to grow in the presence of a contaminated antibiotic uh, plate. Before I explain what the results might look like, let's think about how we culture bacteria. Scientists use either glass or acrylic plates called petri dishes, and we often call them plates and we talk about plating things. Uh, and in that petri dish, there is also an agar, nutrient agar. Agar is like jello with nutrition in it. When you see a circle, you're gonna be seeing a rendition of a, a bacterial culture petri dish. So one of the prime components of bacterial nutrition in a lab is something called luria broth. So think about soup broth, right? It's got proteins, it's got lipids in it, it's got all the stuff you need to get uh, your nutrition boosted up. So the luria broth agar is going to be abbreviated as LB. When we think about adding a gene or not adding a gene, that's the control and the test. Adding a gene, we just say plus, positive. Not adding the gene, we say negative. So LB negative means Luria broth with a regular old wild type bacteria. LB positive means Luria broth with a genetically modified organism. 
So then the next step is ampicillin. If we, if we take ampicillin, the antibiotic, we can actually put it in the agar, and that makes it a poisonous agar plate that will kill the bacteria. If we have a bacteria that is being subjected to that plate, but it's wild type, that would be LB minus AMP, or Luria broth, regular wild type culture, ampicillin infused. If we have the gene added and we're on an ampicillin plate, then we'd see LB plus AMP. Luria broth, genetically modified organism in ampicillin plate. So you're going to see LB minus, LB plus, LB minus AMP, LB plus AMP. Those are the four zones of our test. All right, so the genes that we're using are ampicillin resistance and a glow marker gene. The tests we're using are LB minus, LB plus, LB minus AMP, and LB plus AMP. Now let's get into how we get the bacteria ready and how we actually get the DNA in the test group. So 10 to 20 hours before our lab, I've done what's called a streak plate. And ideally, I like 18 to 20 hours. After 24 hours, the bacteria get a little sleepy and they're less likely to take up the DNA. So I like to have a 20-hour-old culture. The evening before the lab, I'll take the harmless E. coli strain I'll put it on a sterile inoculating loop, and I'll do what's called a streak plate, where I basically streak the bacteria across the plate and streak it across the other way, and then cap it and incubate it overnight. When I do that, what's going to happen is you're going to get small isolated colonies on the fringes, and we call those isolates. So that's the, the bacteria that we want to actually collect to put into our experiment. We're going to start off by taking two test tubes, and we're going to put Luria broth and cold calcium chloride in the first test tube, and we're going to repeat and put that in the second test tube. We're going to label the first test tube with a minus, and we're going to label the second test tube with a plus. So we grab an isolate on, on a inoculating loop, and we put that into our first test tube, labeled minus, with the calcium chloride. And then we take another cluster of bacteria from another isolate, and we put that in the positive labeled test tube, and uh, that goes in with the calcium chloride. We really spin that inoculating loop to get that uh, bacteria to come off of there so we know it's in our test tube. And then we use a sterile pipette to back and forth, back and forth, sort of slosh it around and stir it up. So all of a sudden our calcium chloride is really cloudy, and that's the suspended bacteria. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add the DNA to the plus test tube. So we're actually adding um, restricted fragments of DNA in solution into the test tube. We use an inoculating loop. It's kind of like if you're going to blow bubbles with a little, you know, little bubble loop. Um, you dip it in, lift it up. You have a bead of solution in the inoculating loop, and you just put it into your bacteria and spin it around to make sure it drops off. Now, at this point, uh, we're going to return everything to ice, and we're going to make sure we have a bath of water at 42 degrees Celsius. We need to heat shock these. Now, remember, you always got to do with your control what you do with your test. So we're going to put both the uh, minus and plus labeled test tubes in the water bath and heat shock them. Go immediately from ice to 42 degrees Celsius, bam, heat shock them for 90 seconds and then return them to ice. Now at this point you can hibernate the experiment overnight, put them on ice and keep it in the fridge with lots of ice packed around it and the next day start again. Or if you've got the time, wait 15 minutes and continue. You remove the bacteria from, from the ice, add Luria broth, and give them some recovery time. That recovery time is kind of like, well, imagine if you fell in a frozen pond and were struggling around and somebody rescued you. The first thing they'd probably do is get a blanket on you, get you home, and give you some soup. So these bacteria, they've been fighting for their lives, and now, now we're, we're giving them uh, some yummy nutrition. Now that our bacteria have recovered, we're going to plate them. And so we're going to take the minus test tube and we're going to put a known quantity of bacteria on the minus plate and the minus amp plate. Then we're going to take bacteria from the plus test tube and we're going to put a known quantity on our plus plate and our plus amp plate. So two plates for the minus bacteria, two plates for the plus bacteria, and we're going to use an, a lazy L spreader that's been sterilized, a different spreader of course for each plate and you just spread those droplets across the surface until you have a nice even coat. That's when we're going to cap it up and we're going to incubate it overnight. Why a known quantity? Why 100 microliters? You can estimate the number of bacteria per 100 microliters of solution that take up the gene. We call that their competence rate 
based on the number of colonies you get. If you get 25 colonies, that's 25 bacteria per 100 microliters that take up the DNA competently. Prediction time. I have LB minus and LB minus amp, LB plus modified, and LB plus with ampicillin. What do you expect to find on each of the four dishes? Pause the video right now. Write down your predictions. If you haven't paused it yet, pause it. I want you to think about the four quadrants and I want you to write down your predictions. Hi, welcome back. Hopefully you've got your predictions written down. Here we go. LB minus, a wild type bacteria on a regular nutrition broth. That's gonna be party time. Those bacteria are gonna do very, very well. And what we'd expect is every bacteria is going to reproduce many, many times by binary fission. And those many bacteria are gonna cover the plate. We call that a lawn. You can't distinguish individual colonies. It's one big bacteria party. LB minus amp. Awfully quiet around here. The ampicillin has killed every wild type bacteria. And since all we had was wild type bacteria, there are no bacteria left. They're all dead. LB plus AMP. This one's a little tricky to think about, but remember there's only a certain amount of competence in taking up the new DNA. So even though you have genetically modified bacteria, they're vastly crowded out by the wild type bacteria. So you have lots and lots of wild type bacteria and a few genetically modified bacteria living in good nutrition. What are they going to do? They're going to party it up and they're going to divide like crazy and they're going to have a lawn. The last one. LB plus AMP, the genetically modified bacteria on ampicillin, LB plus AMP. These bacteria are going to express their rate of competence or rate of uptake of DNA by surviving. Any bacteria that does not take up the DNA is going to die, just like LB minus AMP, awfully quiet around here. But those few bacteria that take up the, the gene will be ampicillin resistant they will be able to survive on the nutrition and they will begin to divide and reproduce through binary fission. So you're going to see isolated colonies popping up like stars in the sky. These are the places where bacteria have taken up the gene and then over the incubation period have gone on to reproduce and make a colony. The number of colonies reflects the number of bacteria individuals per 100 microliters of solution that were competent and uptook the DNA. So genetic transformation has a lot of applications in biology. In our purposes, we've shown a few things. First of all, that using restriction enzymes, certain genes can be isolated, and those isolated genes can be moved from point A to point B. In this case, we have given those genes to bacteria, and we've seen that they transformed the bacteria. The bacteria now have the capacity to make new proteins. This reinforces the central dogma of biology that the genetic information in a cell is going to result in a set of proteins that that cell will make. The last thing that we've seen is that there's definitely a lot of applied possibilities here. All right, so four key learning points. Number one, endonuclease or restriction enzymes are able to cleave DNA in certain palindromic sequences, allowing us to snip genes out of a long genome. Two, the central dogma of biology. The genetic code is what is used by a cell to produce proteins. The DNA code will basically instruct the assembly of a group of amino acids into a polymer known as a protein. The order of amino acids and the interactions between the variable groups will result in a protein. That protein then becomes useful to the cell. A gene equates to a functional unit of DNA that encodes for a specific protein. Three, prokaryotic cells, bacteria, are able to incorporate new DNA and then divide with that DNA intact in the copies of their cells. And so we can start to mass produce a gene using bacterial transformation. Four, marker genes can be used to see if bacterial transformation is successful and to uh, measure the rate of bacterial competence in uptaking the new gene. 
So there you have it. Uh, that is the dry lab for bacterial transformation. Now, there are 10 questions that are on your Google Classroom. These are the data and analysis for pea green. Uh, what, I, what I'm going to have you do is do the questions on your own. And then um, if you need the answers, they will be right here on this video. So hold on. No plot spoilers allowed. Please don't listen to these next parts. Go ahead and hit stop now and come back later. And uh, the answers are right here at the end of the video. Here we go. All right, so hopefully you hit stop and it's a new time. You came back an hour later or something. You've already done your uh, questions. You're all done. And now I'm going to go over the answers with you so that you know if you got them right. So here we go. Number one, predict your results, right? Yes or no, depending on whether you think the plate will show growth. Give the reason for your predictions. So LB minus plasmid. In other words, LB wild type doesn't have the plasmid. Prediction, yes. It's going to grow bacteria. It'll grow a lot of it. In fact, it'll grow what's called a lawn. The reason, there's plenty of nutrition and nothing to obstruct the growth of the bacteria. They should double each generation. All right, let's move down to the left, LB amp minus plasmid. So this is an ampicillin infused plate that has no DNA transformation. These are wild type bacteria. The answer would be no. I predict there will be no bacterial growth. Why? They're gonna get killed by the ampicillin. And if you're getting killed by ampicillin, you're not gonna be reproducing. All right, let's go over to the upper right, LB plus plasmid. Prediction, um, yeah, yeah, yes, for sure. Uh, reason, well, because it doesn't matter if you're a transformed bacteria or not, you have all the nutrition you need, you're going to do well, you're gonna double. So there will be a lawn. Last, LB amp plus plasmid, prediction, yes. Uh, even though there's ampicillin on that plate, you now have uh, hopefully at least a few cultures that have uptaken the gene and those Bacteria are going to do a good job in reproducing, but just in isolated colonies. The only ones present will be uh, those that are descendant from those successfully uptaking the DNA. Number two, observe the colonies through the petri plates. Do not open the plates. Uh, and basically, what did you actually observe? Well, LB plasmid, you observed a lawn. LB amp minus, you observed blank, just empty agar. LB plus plasmid, what did you observe? A lawn. And LB amp plus plasmid, what did you observe? Glow in the dark colonies of isolated bacteria. Number three, record your observed results in the spaces above. If your observed results differed from your predictions, explain what you think may have occurred. Well, I'm not sure what you predicted, but I've given you what should have occurred. And so compare what you predicted to what occurred and see what went on. Then think about it. Number four, count the number of individual colonies and using the permanent marker, mark each colony as it is counted. If the cell growth is too dense to count individual colonies, record lawn. So our positive control LB plus plasmid was a lawn and LB minus our positive control was um, also a lawn. LB amp plus plasmid experimental was, um, that was our, our colonies and LB amp minus plasma, negative control, that was um, death. <laughs> There's nothing there. So let's count those individuals right now. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 colonies. So you see 12 colonies there. Compare and contrast the number of colonies on each of the following pairs of plates. What does each pair results tell you? So LB plus plasmid, where we had uh, happy growth, and LB minus plasmid, happy growth, two lawns. It tells us that basically so long as there's a good environment, the wild type bacteria will dominate and they will thrive. So LB plus plasmid, um, not all those bacteria picked up the plasmid. A lot of those are the wild type. And even if they did, that doesn't affect their outcome probably. 
what's going to happen is you're going to see bacteria thriving in regular nutrition environments every time. LB AMP minus plasmid and LB minus plasmid. What that shows is that the same wild type bacteria are going to die when they meet ampicillin. LB AMP plus plasmid and LB AMP minus plasmid. LB AMP plus plasmid, they survived in isolated colonies, and LB minus plasmid, they died in the ampicillin. So what this shows is differential survival in ampicillin. If you have the gene, you're going to make it. And then the last one, LB AMP plus plasmid and LB plus plasmid. This shows us then that if you have the gene, you can survive in the ampicillin, but if you have the gene in a regular environment, the other bacteria survive just as well, and uh, they will crowd in with you. So A shows the ability of the bacteria to grow in a regular nutrition. B shows the frailty of the regular bacteria when, when exposed to ampicillin. C shows how the gene allows certain bacteria that have uptaken the gene to survive. And D shows how the transformed bacteria have the competitive edge in the ampicillin environment. Number six, what allows you to identify which bacteria have taken up the plasmid? We're selecting for the pea green gene, the glow gene. We're also selecting for uh, the ability of the plasmid bacteria to survive in ampicillin environments. So what we're selecting for in this experiment is the ability for a transformed bacteria to survive in a particular environment where the wild type will not survive. And we're again detecting that both through the marker gene and their survivability. Number seven, the phenotype of the transformed colonies tells us that both of the DNA segments were taken up by the bacteria. That to survive ampicillin, you also become a glowing bacteria. Number eight, I would definitely look at the LB plus amp plate. That one has the plasmid and the ampicillin. I want to see if anybody actually survived the ampicillin once they got the new gene. And if they did, then that shows us that the gene was successful and uptaken by the bacteria. Also, I would not look at the LB plus plate because the presence of bacteria on the LB plus plate does not rule out just wild type bacteria. In fact, most of the lawn on the LB plus plate probably was wild type bacteria. And you'll see why when we do number nine, the efficiency or, um, or competence rate of the bacteria is actually pretty low. So number nine, the object is to determine the mass of plasmid that was spread on the experimental plate and that was therefore responsible for the transformance, the number of colonies observed. So adding more DNA isn't actually more successful in transforming bacteria. It may actually inhibit them. The transformation rate is based on the competency of bacterial cells. The bacteria are saturated with the DNA. There's DNA in abundance. So the amount of colonies that show up really is a mark of the competence within the population of bacteria to take up the DNA in those conditions. The first part then determine the total mass in plasmid used. Remember if you use 10 microliters of plasmid in that little inoculating loop at a concentration of 0 0.005 micrograms per microliter, then we're just going to multiply 10 microliters times 0 0.005 micrograms per microliter and we're going to get 0 0.05 micrograms. Calculate the total volume of cell suspension prepared. We had 250 milliliters of, of cold calcium chloride. We had 250 microliters of Luria broth and 10 microliters of DNA plasmid suspension for a total of 510 microliters, half a mil. Now calculate the fraction of the total cell suspension that was spread on the plate. Volume suspension spread divided by total volume suspension. 100 microliters per plate divided by 510 microliters of solution gives you a 0 0.196. Determine the mass of plasmid in the cell suspension spread. Total mass of plasmid times fraction spread equals mass of plasma DNA spread. So that's 0 0.05 micrograms times 0 0.196. That gives us 0 0.0098 micrograms. Now determine the number of colonies, we had 12, per microgram plasma DNA. Express your answer in scientific notation. All right, so the colonies observed divided by the plasmid spread. So my competence transformation efficiency equals 12 colonies divided by 0 0.0098 micrograms, 
which equals 1,224 and a half colonies per microgram of plasmid. That's 1.2 times 10 to the third colonies per microgram. Number 10. Well, let's think about the lab process. First of all, the ability to keep things cool and to actually um, get the cell walls and cell membranes permeable. So the cold calcium chloride is, is a factor. And did you keep it cold? Did it enter cold? And did it have the desired effect on the cell walls? Another thing would be heat shocking. Did you immediately remove the cell suspensions from the ice, put them right in the heat shock water at 42 degrees Celsius for 90 seconds? Did you agitate? Agitation. Did all the cells get circulated during the heat shock? Were there thermal gaps in your test tube? Or did everything get pretty homogenized in there in terms of the temperature? Another thing to consider then might be your overall mixing process. Did you get the plasmid in and actually mix it throughout the whole uh, previous 500 microliters of suspension? The most spectacular results I've ever seen are results I can't really explain, but we actually had a lawn of transformed bacteria, and that was in an LB plus ampicillin plate. I'd never seen that before. I'm not sure what happened there, but the transformation efficiency was ridiculous. And so every condition that could have happened to make those bacteria able to uptake the, the DNA, every condition happened. And so, again, we can consider the effectiveness of chilling the calcium chloride, the effectiveness of circulation of the solution and the reaching of the chemical compounds, the circulation of heat shocking, the speed of going from cold to heat for heat shocking, the recovery and plating process. All of these things come into play when determining whether or not the bacteria in their environment will come in contact with DNA and then have the ability to move that DNA inside their cell. All right, uh, send me your questions if you have them on the Google Classroom. We'll talk soon.